is America. Don't catch you slipping now. Don't catch you slipping now. Look what I'm whipping now. Hi folks, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about ancestry. Determining ancestry is by far the most difficult hurdle to attempt when identifying a decedent. Uh, we talked about age, sex, and stature. Those are relatively easy. The problem with ancestry, or determining what part of the world the individual came from, is a lot. First of all, we've got to deal with admixture. Second, we've got to put it into language that the lay folks understand, all kinds of things that we have to deal with. So we're going to talk about these things one at a time. First of all, what part of the body is best at determining ancestry? By far, the best part is the skull. Why? Well, most of the differences that we see around the world happen in the skull. Mid-facial characteristics are one of the biggest. That is the middle of the face, meaning around the nose. The dental arcade, the teeth themselves, so offer up some other things. All sorts of parts of the skull tell us where that individual came from. Okay, so why do we need to determine ancestry in the first place? Fundamentally, it narrows down the list of possible individuals that you could be identifying. Second, sex and stature both are determinant upon ancestry. If we understand where, what part of the world this person draws from, or where their ancestors are from, it helps us with determining sex because it's much more accurate, and it helps us with determining stature because the formula are associated with ancestry. So fundamentally, this, although it's the hardest thing to pull off, is really the first one. We're meeting it last because it's so complex. But with this understanding of what we have from the other ones should help us understand how we do this. First and foremost, we have to deal with ancestry versus the term race. Race is not used by physical anthropologists. We don't use it because race is a culturally derived term. Uh, what one culture considers one race, like for example, black, a different culture may determine as white, which is interesting. There's no hard and fast rule as to what's this or what's that. There is no biological marker for race. However, People self-identify with race. It's a classification. It's used in all sorts of applications, hospital forms, US Census. Of course, your FAFSA for being a student, they often ask you your race. Let's talk about some of those things. Why do we use the term race? Well, fundamentally, we have to put these terms. Normally, in physical anthropology, we would not use the term race at all because it means nothing. However, we now have to change ancestry into a usable dialogue that we can have with law enforcement and uh, people of a jury, people, the judges, all sorts of lay public who don't necessarily understand the nuances thereof, so they use the term race quite a bit. Categories in the US Census are a great example of what we normally categorize, in other words, what we also self-identify as. First of all, there's black, which in the United States is considered an African origin, but it may be from other parts of the world. We'll talk about that. White, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, Asian, American Indian, Eskimo, Polynesian, or other. Now you can see <laughs> there's a lot of bits and pieces here that don't really make sense. First of all, Hispanic, means nothing. Hispanic is a culture. In other words, you can be white Hispanic, you can be black Hispanic, you can even be Asian Hispanic, and I'll talk about what that means later on. American Indians are in fact Asiatic. Eskimo, Asiatic. Polynesian, Asiatic. In the terms of biology, we split these into three fundamental basic parts, and I'll tell you what those are in a minute. For the terms of physical biology, and physical anthropology, we only separate skulls into those things that are actually categorizable, meaning there is some determinant factor. There is some feature which determines 
one from the other. Therefore, we only split it into three fundamental categories. That is Caucasoid or Caucasian. This is usually considered Indo-European, meaning European and Indian, I'm sorry, from the continent of India, not Native American. You should point that out too. Columbus was not very bright. So Caucasian includes Indo-European spectrum. There is also Asiatic, which includes Native Americans, which we talked about just a minute ago, and a lot of other Native groups, Polynesians, etc. And then the last group is SSA, or Sub-Saharan African. Now, Sub-Saharan African is different from African American, and we'll explain what those differences are in a minute, but fundamentally know this. Almost every skull on the planet shows some form of admixture between two or more of these categories, okay? So we'll talk about some of these things in a minute, but first we're gonna simplify it. We're going to look at those easy to determine traits, which in a non-admixed skull first to clarify these things. Then we'll see that you're gonna see some in one thing and some in another, or skulls that have some categories that are all mixed together. These things are gonna become clearer and clearer, but fundamentally we're gonna do it very similarly to how we determine sex. We'll talk about that. Okay, first of all, let me throw out a hypothetical situation. This is from Tim White, and it's a really meaningful thing. Fundamentally, if you were a speaker and you were brought into a lecture hall with 1,000 people, and there are 400 native Nigerians 300 native Chinese and 300 native Norwegians. Would you be able to tell them apart with all their skin and everything else? The answer is yeah. Without any special training, you'll be able to say those folks in this group are Chinese, those folks in this group are Norwegian, those folks are from Nigeria. Does that make sense? We all feel fairly comfortable that we could probably do that. However, with skulls, can we do it? The answer again is yes. We can do it by measuring. We can also do it by determining whether or not certain traits are there, present, or not there, absent, okay? So basic skull morphology will differ by fundamentally these geographic regions, but remember, there's only three categories, and usually in a geographic region like, I don't know, the United States, or even the Americas, or even Europe, you're gonna see a lot of admixture so no one single person is gonna fall purely into one category or another very often. Usually they're gonna have a mixture of those categories and our plan is to determine which of these they have the most of, very similarly to how we determine sex, where we make a checklist and we say, well, these traits are male, these traits are female, there are more female traits than male traits present, therefore this is probably female. We will do the same thing with this. Although we may come up with a tie. You may have half Asian and half uh, Sub-Saharan African traits. What would you call that? More than likely, here in the United States, we would call that African American or black. That'd be a very common thing to do. But we'll also see these traits mixed with Indo-European traits and Asiatic traits, Sub-Saharan African traits and Indo-European traits, all sorts of mixes, okay? So, how do we do it? Most of it is gonna come from the skull and dentition. Some people claim that postcranial skeleton is of use. What? I strongly disagree. This is coming from old samples, which what they're actually seeing is based on socioeconomic status more than actual ancestral traits. Uh, things like the bowing or not bowing of the femur, things like that, which are absolutely bunk in modern day groups where we don't have such a class disparity due to very, very deeply ingrained racism. Now, I'm not saying racism is gone. We still have very deeply ingrained racism in this country, that's obvious. But what I'm saying is because it's no longer uh, as flagrant as it used to be, we now have much more fluidity between the socioeconomic status 
therefore we don't see these clear markers which back in the day were mistaken for ancestral traits. Okay, the three fundamental groups are Asian, African, and European or Indo-European. So it includes the Middle East and India as well in the Caucasoid or Indo-European group. Okay, so let's break these down. First of all, let's look at a very typical Caucasoid or Caucasian skull. They have a narrow, high bridged nasal bones. Now what we're looking at here, and make sure you remember this, we're just looking between the eyes here. We're not looking down here. We will for other things like nasal sills and a extended nasal spinale, which is down here. But really with this narrowness, we're looking right here. See how skinny it gets? Like the pinch between your glasses, really. We have a triangular nasal aperture. We're talking about this here, the nasal hole. It looks very triangular in shape. Prominent nasal spine, which is this down here. Small nasal slits. A nasal sill, which is this prominent kind of um, raised area right along the bottom of the nose, which we'll see different in the Sub-Saharan African group. And narrow, nearly parallel dental arcade. That is, looking from the underside of the skull, if we look at the teeth, it's almost parallel, the narrowness of that arcade. I'll show you some pictures later on. This is not the long list. This is a short list. Also, the orbits tend to slope a little bit and be a little rounded. Uh, this is only part of what we look at. Sub-Saharan African skull. Now, this is literally someone who still lives in the Sub-Saharan area of Africa. We're talking about south of the Sahara Desert. This does not include places like Libya, Egypt, those areas. Those would be considered the Middle East. That would be the Indo-European group. Okay, so first thing we look at is what's called, this is an old term, but the Quonset Hut frontal nasal suture. What we're talking about is this right here. This suture here, the squiggly line. I know the picture isn't so clear, but it looks almost like a Quonset Hut. Now, Quonset Huts are they were a thing that was used in World War II and is to some degree in non-military uh, aspects um, all over the place in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. They're much more rare now, so this is kind of gone by the wayside. They tend to have more squared off orbits, particularly in the uh, interior side here. We see this sort of square shape. They're not as rounded, but this can play into it or play out. You can see on this side it looks very squared. On this side it looks more rounded, which is interesting. Typical uh, admixture. Uh, a long, low, I'm sorry, a low, wide nasal bones. Now we see the nasals not peaking like we saw with the Indo European group. We're now seeing it's kind of low and flattened. Okay? The wide nasal aperture. Very open. There is subnasal prognathism. That means down this part, and we're not talking about just the teeth. We're not talking about an overbite. We're talking about this entire area comes out forward under the nose. We'll show you a better picture of that later on. There's also a lack of those nasal sills. Now we have something that was used to be called nasal guttering. We also have a very low nasal spine here. What this is saying to us is the nose is low and wide, okay? Again, we've got flaring zygomatics. That's the cheekbones here, and they kind of flare out to the sides. Not as much as what we're going to see in the Asiatic skull, okay? More arched dental arcade. Again, when we look at it from underneath, we're going to see this nice arc, beautiful dental arcade. And the nasal spine is very, very short or completely non-existent. That's right here. Okay. There are a lot of other things that we're going to look at. The Asiatic skulls tend to have very narrow, low bridge nasals. So the nasals aren't as prominent out here, but they still seem fairly narrow. The diamond shape of the nasal aperture, it's kind of halfway in between the Sub-Saharan African and the Indo-European. They tend to have a little bit of a nasal sill and a little bit of a nasal spine, but not as prominent. 
they have very flared zygomatics, very wide, flattened cheekbones that tend to go straight out to the sides. They don't sweep back like those in the Indo-European and Sub-Saharan African. We'll see that later. Very narrow nasal aperture, but that can be in between. It depends. And the biggest thing that they have that less than 2% of Sub-Saharan African or Indo-European skulls have are something called shovel-shaped incisors. We'll see what those incisors look like. The incisor teeth are the middle four teeth here. They're your smiling teeth in between the canine teeth. And they have a very distinctive shape on the back side. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so let's look at these three side by side. Here we have a typical Sub-Saharan African group you can see this very wide, low nose aperture, nasal opening, this kind of arc to the nasal suture, and these sort of swept back cheekbones. Here in the Asia, Asiatic skull, you see the nose is kind of in between. The width of the aperture is sort of in between. You can see now how wide and forward these zygomatics are, these cheekbones. It's also a little interesting malar tubercle down here, which is indicative of an Asiatic skull. Plus, we could look at the back side of these teeth. They would show us those shovel-shaped incisors. Finally, the Indo-European group, we have this pinched nose in between. You see it's narrower between the eyes, the orbits here, the eye sockets, here and here, here to here, and here to here, really narrow, really narrow. The nose is very narrow. This pinches way up. Again, the cheekbones are kind of swept back. The mouth is very narrow. Also, it's very flattened. From the chin to the nose, the teeth generally are in that plane, whereas these teeth tend to come forward. The, nose, the chin is back here, the teeth come forward, and then the nose is back here. We'll show you that later on. Again, we're looking at the interorbital breadth. That is the difference between the eye sockets. This is the Sub-Saharan African, very wide. This is the Indo-European, very narrow, okay? Nasal projection, or the how much the nose comes out from the face, the European, you can see this kicks way out. You can see the nasal spine sticking out and this, the nasals on top. If you put these together in a triangle shape, we have a very prominent nose. Furthermore, you can see the nose and the chin come out past the teeth. We'll see in a Sub-Saharan African nose up here to the chin, but the teeth especially back here, even all this material. Remember, we're not talking about an overbite here. We're talking about this part of the skull comes outward. See it again here, but this is admixed. Very interesting. The nasal sill. You can see these little arrows down here, these little black arrows. This is the sill. It's very prominent, and then it goes out to this very prominent nasal spine. This is the base of what becomes the septum. That's the little wall between your nostrils. This is the bony base. And then it continues out here with cartilage. So the nose, the external nose, comes way out on this individual. The sill and the spine are indicative of that. Over here, we don't have any nasal sill. You can see it just slides down very smooth. We have a very small nasal spine and the nasal bones up top are very low. They're not peaking way up like this, a very prominent way. The prominence of the nasal spine I've pointed out before, but here we are again in an, yet another picture. We can see this really sticking out nasal spine. The cheekbones tend to sweep backward for both the Sub-Saharan African and the European or Indo-European. The Asiatic do not. They're almost forward projecting. What we're looking at here, and we'll show you another picture where it shows the angles, but these cheeks kind of sweep back like this. 
These do not. These go scoop. There's a scooped out area here, but then they come forward. This is what gives that really high cheekbone look of people of Asiatic descent. You'll also notice that in Native Americans, including people who would consider themselves uh, Hispanic, like people of Mayan or Aztec descent, we see these very prominent cheekbones. Okay, Here it is from underneath. And what we're looking at is over here, we've got an Asiatic skull. You see how straight across these cheekbones are? Whereas, and this one unfortunately got into shadow, but you can see we have this sweep back motion on these. And this would be a, a Sub-Saharan African skull. This is the uh, subnasal prognathism that I was talking about, also known as alveolar. Alveolar bone, this word here, this is the bone that holds the teeth, that's all. So in Indo-European, I missed with this uh, line a little bit. But this would go straight down, you can see it touches, it's virtually flat, whereas this, we've got this kick out here of this subnasal prognathic face. The jaw comes forward. The skull vault, the complexity of cranial sutures. This is indicative of the Asiatic descent. You see how, how squiggly these lines are? In fact, there's extra bones. They've gone so squiggly that there's yet another, they've actually engulfed and gone around and created extra bones. This is so prominent in Asiatic, including Native American skulls, we actually call these extra bones here, we call them Inca bones. Technically, this is a whole extra bone here. We have got a parietal, a parietal, the occipital bone, and here is almost two separate bones, but they're not quite separated by the suture down the middle because these sutures are so busy. Comparatively, on this tiny little picture, I don't know why it's so small, see how boring these sutures are? Just going back and forth real slow. This is a typical Sub-Saharan African or Indo-European skull. This is a typical Asiatic skull with very, very busy sutures, okay? Skull vault traits, generally, this is really, really weak evidence, by the way, because skulls change in shape, especially after birth. But generally, longer front to back, in other words, if it's elongated from here to here, this is usually associated with the cranial vault of someone from Sub-Saharan Africa. Wider side to side is usually Asiatic, but can be can also include Indo-Europeans. Indo-Europeans are kind of falling between the two. Uh, these are measured and, and statistic. So you can see this longer skull here. Whereas if it was wider side to side, very round, tends to be a very Asiatic. The dental traits, these are those shovel-shaped incisors that we were talking about. Here in image A, we can see very flat, very spatulate, very flat backside to the incisor teeth. These are the four central incisors, very flat. Here is some very prominent, you see these, these kind of ribs down the sides of the teeth, causing this little hollow in the back of the teeth. This is extremely common in Asiatic skulls. So much so, over 98% of Asiatics have this trait. Less than 2% of non-Asian skulls have this trait. So it's a very telltale marker of admixture or Asiatic descent, okay? Now, there are some metric analyses that we can use. They're fundamentally discriminant functions. That means that if you put in criteria, if you fill in the data, it will give you an answer. It's a statistical equation and it uses cranial measurements as variables. This is where we pull out our calipers and start measuring everything from place to place to place. Giles and Elliott invented it back in the 1960s, but it really was far too simplistic to work and it did not work. Fast forward to the mid-90s uh, in the University of Knoxville, which is where the body farm is. 
they started using theirs and other forensic databases and they created this this computer program called Fordisk. But I'm here to tell you Fordisk doesn't work if you don't know what you're working with. If you don't have a hunch already, you can literally put in any equations, any measurements, and it'll spit out an answer. And the answer is going to be one of the three. Sub-Saharan African, Asiatic, or Indo-European. They have since put in a lot of other subcategories and other things using all sorts of data that they're getting from around the world. And people are feeding into this data bank uh, daily. But their measurements, you don't have to use all the measurements available. Oftentimes there's a few missing, like the skull is broken in one way or another, or it's just missing a, a piece, in which case um, you can still use this program. However, the program will always give you an answer. You can put in a volleyball and it'll spit out what it thinks it is. Um, so you have to know what you're doing to use Fordisk well. And we'll play around with this if we're back in class again uh, in the fall. We'll play around with Fordisk uh, in the 119 lab class. Now there are a lot of limitations and problem areas in ancestry determination. I've already associated with a few of these, but children's skulls, not diagnostic in any way just they vary way too much. They're still growing. All kinds of things are changing. There are no clear markers with the exception of those shovel shaped incisors are the only thing that can show us anything, but even that is unreliable. Culturally defined groups like Hispanic, for example, this is an Asian skull, but this person calls themselves Hispanic. Why? Because they are of Mexican descent. They are Aztec ancestrally. So there you go. This is admixture between Sub-Saharan African and Indo-European. Oftentimes people will side with the minority group, which is interesting. So if they're self-determining or self-evaluating, they will often say, like this woman did, I am African or black American. 